Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. Today our guest is Peter Brugel, who is the Program Director at Oregon Peaceworks. He's doing a PowerPoint presentation entitled The Militarization of America, Who Wins and Who Loses. Peter. Hello. I'm Peter Brugel, and I will be your host for the following program, which is entitled The Militarization of America, Who Wins and Who Loses. It was prepared by the Fund Our Communities Bring the War Dollars Home Project of Maryland with input from Oregon Peaceworks. The first question you might ask is, how much do we spend on the military? Here's a picture of the federal budget for 2012, this year. And this is a part of the budget that's called the discretionary budget. First of all, we have the part of the budget that has to do with human resources, general government, physical resources, and just about everything we want government to do other than the military. Here we have the military, which is divided into the current military, which is what we're paying for it this year, and the past military, uh, which is significantly the debt and the money that we spend on the veterans. However, the government understands that we don't really think that we should be spending half of our uh, discretionary budget on the military. They know that the public will be a lot happier if it's a lot smaller number, say around 20 or 25 percent. So in 1969, under the Johnson administration during the Vietnam War, the government came up with the idea of the unified budget. And to get the unified budget, they added in the Social Security programs, the, uh, the other programs such as that, which would not normally be in the uh, discretionary budget, and they put it all together as one large, large, large unified budget and then, of course, the military portion of that looks a lot smaller. It's not really any smaller, of course, but it looks smaller when you present it in a pie chart like this. So let's take a look at what's involved with that. The president's proposed and discretionary spending uh, for the next fiscal year. As you can see, it's composed of a discretionary portion, uh, about 31 percent, a mandatory portion, which is 62 percent, and the interest on the debt that we're carrying. That's the national debt. Now, looking at the mandatory spending, it's composed of a bunch of items that have already been decided that we're going to spend for this year. So, in other words, a law was made last year or the year before or the year before that that said we're going to spend this much money in this fiscal year on this amount of money. So that decision has already been made. And as you can see, the largest portion of, the, portion of that is Social Security, unemployment, and labor. Uh, and those are funded primarily by uh, special taxes that we pay separately from the discretionary budget. You also see another big chunk of that is Medicare, which is another program that's funded in that manner. Now here's the uh, discretionary spending for 2013. As you see, a huge segment of it, more than half, is devoted to the military. And on the left side of the picture there is everything else. So education, government, housing, community, veterans, benefits, everything else is separate from the military portion of the budget. Now let's try and get a feel for, for this a little bit by asking ourselves, since 9-11, since the 9-11 disaster uh, in 2001, how much have we spent on the military versus how much have we spent on some of the other things that we uh, want to do with our government? If you look there on the right, you see the Pentagon's base budget, $5.6 trillion dollars in that decade. The Iraq and Afghan uh, wars are the next largest piece of it, uh, $1.6 trillion. 
then you get homeland security and nuclear weapons and after that after all these military expenditures you get the budgets of agriculture commerce interior labor transportation and the epa all put together combining to less than even the nuclear weapons portion now it's fairly difficult to really un uh, understand what these huge numbers really mean millions billions even trillions of dollars what does that mean? So let's get a feel for these numbers. Let's take a look, for example, at the amount of money spent by the Pentagon in one year versus the entire spending for the National Institutes of Health since it was created in 1938. That $553 billion, which was the 2012 base military budget, uh, is greater than the total amount ever spent for the National Institutes of Health. Here's another way to look at it. The United States military spending outranks all other countries. In fact, it outranks all other countries put together. But let's take a look at the next few countries in line. We have the United States way across the top there. Then we have China, France, the United Kingdom, Russia, Japan, Germany, and Italy. And please notice that none of these countries is currently an enemy of the United States. China is a huge trading partner. The other countries are in NATO, uh, except for Russia and Japan. So we are talking here about spending an enormous amount of money, much more than any other country in the world, but much more than any other country in the world, to defend ourselves against whom? Here's another way to look at it. We have the United States there, the big dot on the left, and then the other countries that we just noted. And it's just really incredible to realize, as you see there on the right, that the next 10 countries in terms of military spending don't even begin to come to the amount of money spent by the United States if you take them all put together. Here's another way to look at it that's really important. How much money do we spend on defense or on war per capita? That's each one of us. And as you see, in the United States, it's somewhere between $2,500 and $3,000 per person, which is far more than any other country in the world. So you might ask, where does all this money go? What do we buy with all this money? Is it worth it? Let's find out. There's four categories that we're going to look at here. First, the Pentagon spending, then the war costs, foreign military bases, and war profiteers. Let's start with the Pentagon spending. Here we see that since 2001, the military budget, as shown in the dark blue uh, color, has been rising steadily. But beginning right about that time when we first went into Afghanistan, the uh, war funding budget, which has to be added to that military base budget, has also been increasing. So the total has increased an enormous amount. In fact, as you can see, it's more or less tripled. And let's ask also the question, what's in the military budget? This is a blow up from that pie chart that we had very, at the very beginning of the show where we looked at the current military and the past military. As you can see here, we have the total outlays of the DOD budget, the defense Department of Defense budget, uh, $707 billion of that, but we don't have, but that doesn't uh, tell the whole story. That involves things like military personnel, operations and maintenance, procurement, so forth. But there's also the non-Defense Department military spending, which includes retiree pay uh, and the health care for the military. It includes the nuclear weapons portion, which is actually in the Department of Energy. It includes 50% of the National Science and uh, 
administration, international security, and other smaller amounts. So it comes up to a total of $869 billion for this particular year. We also might ask, where does the money go in terms of the war costs? The total direct cost of both wars at this time is $1.26 trillion. We're talking about Iraq and Afghanistan through 2011. So we have spent enormous amounts of money, $1.26 trillion, trillion dollars, a trillion dollars incidentally is a thousand billion since we started these wars. To bring that into focus, in 2011, the United States spent more on the war in Afghanistan than any other country in the world spent in total on its military. You remember from the slide previously that China was the second in line for military spending. Well, they did not spend in as much in a whole year on their entire military as we spent just on the Afghanistan portion of the wars. What, what is that amount, $122 billion? Well, let's take a look at our total state budget shortfalls for that same year. That was $112 billion. In other words, if we had not spent $122 billion on the war in Afghanistan, we could have funded the budget deficit for every single state in the Union and had plenty of money left over to do something else. In fact, $33 billion, which is the escalation in, since 2010, in other words, the amount of money more that we spent in Afghanistan since 2010, uh, the next year, amounted to $33 billion, which is 600,000 U.S. jobs. And we're not talking about we're not talking about minimum wage, jo wage jobs here. We're talking about $55,000 a year family wage jobs. The total estimated cost of our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan comes to someplace between four and six trillion dollars estimated. Now why is that so much? Because we will continue paying for these wars for quite a long time as we pay for uh, the, the debt that we incurred for them as we pay for the, for the medical expenditures of all the people that got hurt and so forth. Let's just take the $3.5 trillion as a, as a number there since it's a little less than the lowest of the estimates there. With that amount of money, $3.5 trillion, we could send every 18-year-old in the United States to a state university we could pay all their education expenses, their tuition, their fees, their room and board for four years for each one of them, and we could do it for the next 133 years. That's how big a number that is, T considering the foreign military bases. The United States has about 1,000 military bases that it maintains off U.S. soil in foreign countries around the world. They cost the taxpayers, that's you and me, about $250 billion a year. Here's a picture that shows where they all are. As you can see, there's huge numbers of them. They are all over the world, and you can imagine how some countries might feel being surrounded by our military bases. 95% of all the military bases that any country has on another country's soil are U.S. military bases. The meaning of that is that it's really a new form of imperialism. As Chalmers Johnson said, once upon a time you could trace the spread of imperialism by counting up the colonies. America's version of the colony is the military base. Let's also remember that the Declaration of Independence criticized the British 
for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us and for protecting them from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states. We wrote that in the Declaration of Independence when we were explaining to the world why we were declaring our independence from the British. You could say that foreign bases create enemies and make us less safe. For the same reason that we declared our independence from the British, other countries may be quite unhappy with us. Uh, lastly, the money in the military budget goes to war profiteers. These are large companies which make a huge amount of money by charging the United States government for war materiel, more services. An example of that is Lockheed Martin. These, kind of, these people are kind of a, a poster child for this. The percentage of Lockheed Martin profits that is derived directly from U.S. taxpayers in 2010 was 84 percent. In other words, 84 percent of the profits that they made came right out of yours in my pocket. The amount of taxpayer money which was listed as profit in that year was a whopping $3.2 billion that this one company made by providing war materials to our government. Meanwhile, the compensation of the Lockheed Martin CEO that for, that, for the next year was $21.9 million. Now remember, you and I are paying that man's salary. A former Lockheed Vice President, Bruce Jackson, who chaired the Committee for the Liberation of Iraq uh, in 2002 and 2003, formed the most influential lobby group for the Iraq War, that Committee for the Liberation of Iraq. And he was the Vice President of Lockheed Martin. So this is really important to understand because these folks who are profiting so excessively on the U.S. contracts with these companies are the ones who are urging us to get into these wars. In all, the military contractors uh, employed 682 revolving door hires in 2010. And these are individuals who oversaw arms companies while in government and then went on to work for the same firms. So we have that revolving door concept very important because the people who are making the decisions about wars and, and about military spending are very often the ones who are profiting from it, have profited from it, or will profit from it. The ideal distribution of contracts is not determined by who can do the best job, but the best way to do it, as uh, this economist and former Pentagon official said, is to build it in all 435 congressional districts. And it doesn't matter whether it works or not, because then the, the member of Congress from that district will defend the contract because they're getting pork from it in their district. And this is very important to understand. As it says here, in 2009, Lockheed Martin placed full-page ads in the Washington Post showing the number of jobs for the F-22 fighter project by congressional district. If that doesn't make the point, I don't know what does. Lockheed Martin is, as I say, a poster child for the military contractor because they made $2.8 million of donations in the 2010 uh, electoral cycle. And in 2012, they've already put $1.6 million in. And these are donations that they make to the people who are going to be making the decisions that they want made. In addition to that, they spend $15 million on paid lobbying. They make political donations on both sides of the Republican-Democratic divide. They made a donation in the uh, 2011 to 2012 political uh, cycle of $14,000 plus to Barack Obama, but they also paid uh, 15, almost $16,000 to Ron Paul. The total to the congressional incumbents in the 2012 cycle so far is 
$1.4 million. So these people are big players. And when the representatives for Lockheed Martin walk into your office, if you're a congressperson, you are going to listen because they are going to determine whether you have the money to uh, fund your next campaign. What do the military contractors do? Well, they do everything that the government used to do by itself. They feed the troops, they maintain the facilities and equipment, they transport cargo, they wash clothes, they provide security guards for bases and diplomats, they engage in military actions. They're doing everything that the military used to do and they're making a profit on it. So, off, so obviously it's going to cost more money. Whose money? Your money and my money. This business of contractors is very important to understand because taking the war in Afghanistan, you can see from this graph that the number of military contractors over there has at all times exceeded the number of troops that we have over there. And they continually do that. So we are paying more people to be military contractors than we are uh, the troops that we say that we want to uh, make sure that we protect the military this way. What are the implications? Well, first of all, powerful companies promote war because it's profitable. And we saw that a little bit earlier. That was the business of putting the uh, contracts in all 435 congressional districts. The profit motive in war can be very counterproductive. The oversight of contractors is negligible, and the contractors often do poor jobs. When you have a person in the military ordered to do something by a superior officer, that officer then has control over what happens. However, if we assign those jobs to contractors, we may not have anywhere near as good oversight. The most common types of contracts are cost plus contracts and they encourage waste and unnecessary spending because you get the cost plus a certain profit. The costs are higher, you make more money. It's just that simple. So here's a picture that shows what really happens. We're told that a rising tide lifts all boats, but the boats tend to be the large corporations while the ship of state sinks to the bottom and all of us are actually on that ship of state. So that's how we're actually spending our money on the military. And when we do that, we are militarizing our country. Let's see what the militarization of America actually costs us. First of all, we have the macroeconomic costs. What do we mean by that? Increased spending on the military relative to other parts of the economy means that we have fewer jobs in other parts of the economy. It means we get higher interest rates and it means we get greater inflation. In other words, a weaker economy. Another thing, and this is very important to understand, is that we're often told that the military creates a lot of jobs. Nothing could be further from the truth. While it is true, that if you spend a billion dollars of federal money on anything, it will create some jobs. The fact of the matter is that if you spend it on the military, as shown on the right here, you will get fewer jobs than if you spend it in any other sector of the economy. And this has been shown by study after study after study beginning in the 1970s. So to sum it up, War makes a lousy jobs project. What else does the militarization of America cost us? Well, there's environmental costs. Did you know that the US military is the biggest polluter in the world? It generates an estimated 750,000 tons of toxic waste every year. And did you know that the military burns an estimated 20 million gallons of gasoline every day? That's about the same as the entire country of Iran, which, remember, is a large oil producer. 
furthermore the military rights its status of force agreements to exempt the united states from the responsibility for cleaning up environmental damage these start status of force agreements are the agreements that it makes with other countries when it cites bases there and right there in those agreements it says that the u.s is going to have to clean up our environmental damage the result is huge environmental messes all over the world but especially in our own country another thing that the militarization of america costs us is it weakens our democracy let's see how militarism restricts our freedom at home and militarism brings immense amounts of money into the political system as we've seen which corrupts it a great example is in Maryland where this PowerPoint presentation was originally developed by our partner over there. The county council in Montgomery County in Maryland passed a resolution which urged the United States Congress to make major reductions in the Pentagon budget. And there was a, a bunch of other language there. Well, Lockheed Martin, our old friend, started having its lobbyists calling around. Remember the $15 million that was being spent on lobbying? It started having its lobbyists call around to the powers that be in Montgomery County. And two of the five supporters of the resolution dropped off, and the resolution was consequently withdrawn. So the attempt that the people made to get their voice heard by petitioning their government for redress of grievances was immediately cut off by the lobbying of Lockheed Martin. In what other ways can Millism threaten our democracy? Militarism erodes fundamental rights. It causes legalization of torture, as we've seen at the uh, Guantanamo base, and the people who were captured as so-called terrorists uh, during the war in Iraq. Then the people who were given trials at Guantanamo were tried not under uh, the usual court uh, regime, but under kangaroo courts under the Military Commissions Act. And now, under the National Defense Authorization Act of 2011, we lost the right of habeas corpus, which is an important Fourth Amendment right, which was granted by the uh, Bill of Rights, which, of course, was part of the founding of our country. Another thing that uh, militarism does is it demonizes certain citizens who lose basic rights. Examples are the Japanese uh, during World War II, the Arabs during our conflicts in the Middle East, and Muslims in general. We've been listening to Peter Bergel with the Oregon Peace Works. I hope that you found this program informative and that you'll join us again next week. Bye.